Kia ora, everyone. I'm Claire Gallup, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome you here to the 2017 University of Otago three-minute thesis final. I'd like to welcome everyone who's watching by live stream, people in the northern cam campuses, and people in the future. Welcome, and I hope you enjoy this uh, special event. People in the future, I would quite like to know if there are still bananas and also if there's still fake news. If someone could get back to me, that would be great. All right, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the three-minute thesis um, and a little bit about why I'm so interested in the three-minute thesis. I'll introduce the judges and then I'll get us underway with what you're really here for, which is to hear these wonderful people present their awesome work. The three-minute thesis was, was devised by the University of Queensland in 2008. The competition has grown and is now run in over 200 countries across the world. I looked up one reference and it said 19, over 19 countries, and then I looked at another one and it said 200. I'm going to take the larger one because that just seems so much more impressive. There's now a New Zealand version for master's students. The other versions are for PhD students solely. And we were delighted that in the last time that we ran the three-minute thesis, Jenny McDowell from the Faculty of Dentistry actually managed to make the final of the Trans-Tasman uh, three-minute thesis competition. That is a huge accomplishment in terms of just how many people are involved in that particular competition. Right, so why am I interested in the three-minute thesis? I kind of just am. About this time last year, when my boss, Rachel Spronken-Smith, Dean of the Graduate Research School, then boss, was trying to palm me off onto some other part of the university, I said to her, all right, I'll go, but only if you let me still be involved in the three-minute thesis. She said, okay, I'll do it. And I hope she doesn't live to regret it, but I do know that the Faculty of Dentistry might have a few bones to pick with you, Spronken-Smith. All right, I think the three-minute thesis is a fantastic event for two main reasons. The first is it's always a highlight of the graduate research calendar. Whenever it's run by the Graduate Research School, it is always incredibly edifying, incredibly enjoying, and enjoyable, and just amazing to see the fantastic work that our graduate students do. It's a fun event, but that's not all it is about. Being able to conduct research on something one loves is a real privilege, in my view. Being able to do that at a university as fantastic as Otago is another real privilege. The 3MT provides a wonderful opportunity for the university to showcase the work that our research students are doing. Our graduate research candidates and you've all got a lot to live up to from this next sentence, I can tell you, are our future academics and researchers, our future captains of industry, and our future leaders. These are the people that we will see doing great things when we look to those few people of the future who are going to tell me about the existence of bananas. I am confident, confident that our thesis candidates are of a world-class standard, and I am confident that they are receiving world-class supervision by our academic staff, our supervisors and advisors, who are all incredibly accomplished. We have a lot to celebrate here at Otago. I also love it because it's inspiring to hear and see the creative way that people can talk about their research in such a short period of time and with so few props. The 3MT provides an incredible development opportunity. It fosters important skills of clarity and brevity. This is a skill which will last you throughout life. It will help you with elevator pitches and it will most definitely help you when you have an argument with your nearest and dearest. <laughs> Preparing a three-minute thesis, three thesis presentation invariably serves to reignite your passion for your research. I did it a couple of times, I did it very badly, but I still enjoyed it and it still was incredibly helpful. Um, trying to work out what the essence of your research is and how to explain that to a lay person in simple and clear terms is a wonderful exercise for us all to do. 
As a staff member, getting involved in the 3MT provides a lovely opportunity to witness the enthusiasm and the accomplishment of our many thesis candidates firsthand. I said there were two main reasons why I was keen on emceeing the three-minute thesis. The second reason is that I'm a frustrated actor, stroke director, stroke producer, stroke writer. And I heard that someone from Natural History New Zealand was going to be involved in the judging. <laughs> so I thought this was a great opportunity to pitch a few ideas for some t t TV and film. First is a clock tower orange. You know, like this. It's a, dy a dystopian sci-fi film that employs disturbingly violent images about commenting upon PBRF, student fees, and why you can never find your supervisor on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> the second, a soap opera, Great King Street. It's a soap opera about the lives, the loves, and the tooth extractions of a group of dedicated and gorgeous oral health professionals. It's got winner all over it. Finally, Survivor 344, Dancing with the Supervisors, a hybrid reality show that drops supervisors and students onto an active volcano, <laughs> makes them dance the tango, dance of love, until they are competent enough to get their conference funding. Another winner for all the university community, I'm sure. Don't worry, Craig, I've got a million of these and I'll talk to you later. <laughs> All right, speaking of judges, it now gives me immense pleasure to introduce our esteemed judges. Whenever I'm required to introduce anyone of note who has accomplished a lot of things, I throw up a little in my mouth. I'll just be honest with you. I have, however, devised a technique to help with this. I get over this queasiness at their achievements, their success, their so-called dedication, and I, I lie. I just lie about them. That's what I do, and I'm going to do that here today. And next time you introduce someone, I recommend that you do too. See if you can spot the lies, people. I'd like to first introduce Rachel Spronken-Smith. Rachel is the Professor in Higher Education, and she is also the Dean of the Graduate Research School. She has passed head of the Higher Education Development Centre, where she worked as an academic staff developer. She initially trained as a geographer, and she first worked as a research meteorologist, or um, one of those weather girls I think you were, weren't you, Rachel? <laughs> she did her PhD in geography at the University of British Columbia, specialising in urban climatology. And then she lectured at the University of Canterbury in geography before moving into higher education and coming down to Otago. Rachel came to the Graduate Research School in 2012, and I remember it like it was yesterday. As Dean of the Graduate Research School, she works on policy, helps supporting graduate research students, making sure supervisors are occasionally there on a Friday afternoon, um, and she also still does a lot of teaching and research. Her teaching in particular has been recognised with teaching awards at both the University of Canterbury, the University of Otago, and at the national level as well. She has won a Sustained Excellence in Teaching Award uh, at the New Zealand level, and in 2016 she won the Turns Herdza Medal for Sustained Contribution to the Research Environment in New Zealand. She gained a Fulbright Scholar Award in, for research on PhD education. She's heading to the US in 2018. So when Rachel takes up her Fulbright next year, she will be investigating new modes of doctoral research. Primarily, she will be exploring the pedagogy of pick-a-path PhDs. Pick-a-path PhDs. It's going to be great. She's also working on thesis by meme. That will be fantastic to see too, Rachel. <laughs> and finally, she's going to be investigating the use of subliminal advertising in the master's thesis. Trying to work in with the arms industry, I understand. <laughs> Welcome, Rachel. It's lovely to have you here today. The next one I am going to introduce is our esteemed Professor Richard Blakey. Richard is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Enterprise here at Otago. He is also a Professor in Physics. He received his BSc Ons from Otago a long time ago, Richard. I won't say it to embarrass you. A long time ago. And then he went on to do a PhD in Cambridge. 
He was a visiting scientist at the Hitachi Cambridge Laboratory investigating single electron transport effects in semiconductor nanostructures. Rather you than me. He returned to New Zealand in 1993 to take up a position at Canterbury University. He was also the director of the uh, McDermott Institute prior to coming down to Otago. He has been bestowed with many honours and awards. Honestly, it is incredibly tedious to go through them. <laughs> I will mention a few, though. He has received the TK Seide Medal, the Hector Memorial Medal, the Thomas Medal for Science Leadership, um, and as Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Vice finally, Richard is in charge of all research and commercialisation uh, activities at Otago. Currently, Richard is thinking small and moving from nanotechnology to picotechnology. Good man. He's walking the walk of commercialisation as well. Uh, he's working on a collaboration with the Golden Book series, introducing the world of physics to toddlers. <laughs> Look out for soon-to-be classics such as atoms. I can't see them, I just pretend they're there. <laughs> and physics. No one knows how to spell it, let alone do it. <laughs> nice work. Thank you very much, Richard. It's lovely to have you here. Finally... Craig Mead from Natural History New Zealand. Craig Mead is an executive producer, and him and his production team at NHNZ are some of the most successful and prolific producers of wildlife and natural history programs in the world. There have been more than 50 wildlife shows completed in the last four years. I think I've watched more than 50 wildlife shows in the last four years, so I'm doing equally as well as you, Craig. <laughs> anyway. After 30 years of writing and directing, Craig still doesn't class himself as a wildlife filmmaker. He is a science communicator that prefers mud, tents, and mosquitoes to laboratories. When he's not making films, Craig is a deer hunter and an on-call on firefighter. Craig has been involved in the production of shows for National Geographic, the Discovery Channel, and Fox International. Craig has been quoted as saying that predators with big gnashy teeth that commit large-scale violence with other animals really pull the ratings. They also seem to do well in presidential elections too. <laughs> However, in the new current socio-economic climate, he sees an urgent need to move to a more gentle wildlife documentary. He's starting a new branch of natural history called unnatural history. He's pitching such soon-to-be classics as Everyone Has an Aunt That Looks Like a Badger, <laughs> Sloth, Swift Compared to a Stone, Haiku Parrots, and finally and controversially, a town and gown crossover called PBRF Portfolios Not Just for Humans. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here, Craig. I think your career might have peaked somewhat earlier than this, this period. Anyway, uh, enough of all that. It is lovely to have the judges here, and it's lovely to have you here, and it's lovely to have the contestants here. So we'll get on with the real show. I'll tell you a little bit about the three-minute thesis, and then we'll hand over. OK, the prizes. The winning PhD candidate will go on to compete in the 2017 Asia-Pacific 3MT competition in Queensland. That will be um, happening on in, in Friday, the 29th of September and I'm sure that that will be live streamed for us to watch too. The winning master's candidate will go on to compete in the New Zealand Inter-University Challenge at Victoria, and that is uh, to be held in, later in this month. The rules of the game, and this is incredibly important, there is one static single PowerPoint slide. That is it, nothing else, no more. No woos, no wheeze, no buzzy things, just the one static slide. Um, no additional electronic media, although you are allowed to use a microphone, thankfully. No additional props, no costumes, no funny hats, nothing like that, no magic tricks. No laboratory equipment, quite right. Presentations are limited to three minutes and three minutes only, maximum. Once that buzzer rings or bell, oi, thank you, say no more. Zip. Okay. All right. That bell goes and you speak there's a disqualification. Presentations are to be spoken word. No singing or rapping. No limerick, sadly. But it will still be good. Presentations are to commence from the stage. This is the stage. 
Presentations are considered to have commenced when a presenter starts speaking through e or either moving uh, in a way to indicate that their presentation has started. The judging criteria is on communication style, comprehension and engagement. We're looking to see how you can communicate to a lay audience about your passion, your area of interest. We have the timekeeper, Susan Craig. She will be holding up cards, right? And she will be pressing that button, but she's not gonna need to press that one. Okay. Judges will give feedback after each individual presentation. I will run up to them with this one microphone, not that I'm bitter, and I will try not to trip up when I come back down. Okay, so that's what's gonna be happening there. We have 11 finalists, eight PhD, and three master's candidates. Judges, ready? Contestants, ready? Audience, ready? Cool. Saying more with less is hard, Taking an average speaking time of 150 words per minute, your standard PhD candidate would require over 11 hours to read out their PhD, and that's not taking into account footnotes, appendices, or toilet breaks. The average masters would take four and a half hours. This lot have got three minutes to explain their work. No pressure, guys. I know you're up to the task. Let's all give everyone a big, huge round of applause. Right, I would like to welcome Chidama Aham Chiabuto. Chidama is doing a PhD in population health in Christchurch. Her area of interest is the lived experiences of internally displaced women in northern Nigeria. Take it away when you're ready. Good evening, everyone. Just imagine attending a family get together on Christmas and suddenly you begin to hear gunshots. And you become aware that terrorists have overrun your community. Although you manage to escape, many of your family members are killed. What happened in your family, what happened in your community is making headlines. But nobody has ever given you the opportunity to tell your own story. How will you feel? Presently, Nigeria is undergoing a period of armed conflict. Boko Haram, an Islamic extremist group, is determined to topple the Nigerian government. And as a result of the conflict, about 100,000 people have died. And more than 2 million people, 80% of whom are women and children, have been displaced. But much of what we know about these displaced women's experiences are from media reports. So what I have done is to make myself available as an empathetic listener, to give these women the opportunity to tell their own stories. And they told me how their husbands were killed in their presence, and how their boys and girls were abducted by Boko Haram, and how they gave birth to babies in the bushes and left them there to die because they could not take care of them, and how they are under pressure to give birth to more children because many of the children they fled with died and the ones they have now are sick. The privilege of listening to these stories is also a call for action on my part. So for a start, I am doing a critical analysis of these women's stories. I am looking beyond the surface to uncover some historical, social and cultural factors that have underpinned these experiences and how these women interpret them in order to gain some understanding of what is going on. For example, what is making headlines all over the world is that Boko Haram abducted 276 schoolgirls and the whole world is reacting to this. But according to these women, they abducted boys too. They killed the men. And what does this mean to these women? In the Nigerian culture, if you abduct girls, well, it is bad. But if you abduct boys and kill men, you have destroyed the community. And it's as if you have taken the security of these women away. And we need to pay attention to these things. These are some of the nuances I'm uncovering in my analysis. 
And when I am done, I'll be able to work with the Nigerian government to come up with solutions for these women's problems. Thank you. Thank you, honorific judge. Um, Jimmy, that was excellent. What you did very, very well was put us in the place immediately with the Magin and, and drew us into the, the narrative that you had. You uh, were perfect to time and uh, gave us a, a very, very good um, overview of, of what your thesis is. Um, if I was going to suggest improvements, it might be to just have a little bit more time thinking about the the outcomes rather, that was quite brief at the end in terms of what the outcomes of the research might lead to, but overall outstanding. Thank you very much. Chidema, um, as a storyteller, what I appreciated most in that was uh, your deportment, your energy, your tone, your seriousness, all conveyed what that story was going to be about before you'd gotten very far into it. So you kind of embodied it very nicely. Sometimes the teller of a story doesn't actually carry the tone of the story as well. But you did a great job with that. Um, it's a big story to take a bite out of to explain, and I think you did a great job. It left me wanting more, and on a certain level, that's the point. On another level, it's not the point in this competition. But I thought it was wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Chidema. Um, great image there, very confronting research. Again, a terrific story drawing us into that, really appreciated that. And uh, I also liked hearing about how you were doing the research, and like Richard, just wanted to know a bit more, but of course, only three minutes, so terrific job. Thank you. Next up, it is my pleasure to introduce Sabarinath Prasad. He is doing a PhD in oral sciences uh, in the Faculty of Dentistry, aren't you? Yep. And you are doing the SMART project. And I've said enough about that, so I'm going to say over to you. What is the one thing that you didn't forget to carry when you left your homes in the morning today? Your keys, yes. Your wallet, yes, and your smartphone, almost surely yes, even if you did forget the first two, right? Well, it's not just you. Two thirds of adults in New Zealand now own or have access to a smartphone and their numbers are dramatically increasing. Smartphones can now tell you how well you slept yesterday, how many steps you walked today, or even how fast my heart is beating doing this three minute talk. But I want you to wait for a moment and spare a thought for the computer operator on long-term sick leave due to work-related neck and facial muscle pain, or the teacher who lost three of her $10,000 dental implants due to muscle dysfunction. Now, typically what would happen is the teacher and the computer operator would have a detailed but subjective clinical assessment of their muscles, and also a lab-based assessment for accuracy of these muscles with equipment that is presently bulky, wired, and would restrict movements during recordings. Now, until now, this prevented an assessment of muscle behavior and function as it happens in a natural setting, outside the confines of a lab. Well, not anymore, as we have now successfully developed and tested a miniature fidget spinner-shaped device that can detect and wirelessly transmit muscle activity data to your smartphone continuously, for up to two days. What this means is you sitting over there on your smartphone can visualize the activity of my muscles as I speak right here, right now. But you don't want to be trusting those signals as yet, do you? You want to make sure whether those signals are telling you how strong, how long, and how often my muscles are contracting. In other words, you want to be making sure that the device is accurately telling and measuring what it's supposed to be measuring. To answer these questions, what we are doing now in the SMART study is, we are recording from the same muscle at the same time, simultaneously with a wired 
and the new wireless device, the signals generated are then being superimposed to see the extent of match between these signals to validate the device. And my friends, the in initial preliminary results have been very encouraging. Moving forwards, enabling internet connectivity to this device is what we're looking at. This will then help in remote monitoring of muscle activity, which will then help in sending timely biofeedback to the smartphones of the teacher and the computer operator, based on which they can take corrective measures to ease their muscle pain. Pain may not be an option, but suffering certainly shouldn't be. Thank you, that sounds fascinating. Um, I was waiting for why. You got to why, which is great. Um, probably for me, the lay person, hitting why in the first 20 seconds would be ideal. But you got there and it was a clearly understood why, so I appreciate that. Thanks very much, uh, great presentation. I like the way you started by making it relevant to listeners in terms of we could see what the technology was, we've all got smart home phones and, uh, and good use of humour too, so thank you. Yes, um, again, very, very good, very polished, very uh, confident presentation. I like the image. To me, it, it talks nicely about that. I can always refer back to the, the timeline of the project. And again, a really good uh, narrative technique, a trick of asking a question at the start to get people engaged with your talk. So very, very good. Thank you. I tell you what, though, you don't want to see my, uh, what my muscles are doing by any smartphone device. I mean, you really don't. And my uh, pulse was about 98 throughout that. Thank you. OK. Next up, it is my pleasure to introduce Alex. Alex Wilson is doing a Master's in Music, Theatre and Performing Arts in the Humanities. Alex is going to be talking about his thesis, which is Fog of War, British Theatrical Responses to the 2003 Invasion of Iraq in a Post-Truth Political Environment. Take it away, please, Alex. Why did the Coalition of the Willing invade Iraq in 2003? If I took a survey of this room, I would get innumerable answers. And most of those answers would be correct and incorrect at the same time. In the lead-up to the invasion, we were told many things by politicians. That Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. That Iraq had links to 9-11. That Iraq represented a threat to the entire world. These statements were questioned, and these statements were repeated. Evidence was asked for, and evidence was fabricated. These statements were disproved. These statements were maintained. Iraq was invaded. Half a million Iraqis lost their lives and an entire region was destabilized. <coughs> destabilized. Even now, in 2017, we have no real idea why the invasion happened. All we know is that we were kept in the dark by an administration who, instead of providing a dominant narrative about what was going on, decided it was best to exploit the fog of war by providing a series of contradictory statements. This, of course, is nothing new. It's happened time and time again simply look at the behavior of Donald Trump. So words, then, are weapons of mass destruction. They can not only destroy lives, but they can destroy truth, meaning, and critical thought. This, of course, presents a problem for political playwrights, who depend on their words to not only critique politicians and their views, but to present political ideas of their own. So, but if they did this, if a playwright did this, well, they're just presenting their own version of the truth. And doesn't that make them just as bad as the politician they're trying to critique? So my thesis is not only looking at how uh, playwrights have depicted the invasion of Iraq, but also how they've depicted truth in an environment where truth is increasingly more pliable. These changes broadly fall in line with the views expressed by Harold Pinter, who said that playwrights shouldn't be trying to point out what the truth is, but how the truth functions. He says, when we look into a mirror, we think that the image that confronts us is accurate. But if we move but a millimeter, the image changes. So we're looking at an infinite range of reflections. And Pinter says a playwright should smash through this mirror, because it's on the other side that the truth stares at us. We may never know why Iraq was invaded, 
or why politicians do anything, but for playwrights to make more truthful, more ethical work. They shouldn't be trying to fill in these gaps in our knowledge, but rather point to how truth can be used to deceive us. Thank you. Excellent effort, Alex. Um, Love the image, thought it was very fitting, and I also like the play on words around weapons or words of mass destruction. Uh, good, great message. Yes, again, very, very good, Alex. And again, you've done a good thing for me. You've left me with the phrase that I didn't come in the room with. Words are weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you use the, the stage that you have in front of you. Um, I was still, though, left with a what's your contribution to this? It's a big topic, but with the, in your master's thesis, I have or I will, that was still the, the, the piece that I had missing at the end of that. I think it's an important conversation to have, and that was great to hear about it, and you did it with all of confidence, which speaks to me about the quality of your work, I think, behind this. So thank you. I don't know about that Harold Pinter. He's wrong about the mirror. When I look in the mirror, I see a middle-aged, uh, overweight woman. It can't be the case, so absolutely insane. <laughs> yeah, I will smash through it, quite right. Um, okay. Up next, we have Rafaela Habello. She is doing a PhD uh, for the College of Education, and her area is exploring the discourses of social investment in the oil and gas sector. Take it away when you're ready, Rafaela. Thank you. So I want to take you on a journey to that place, and I want you to imagine yourself wearing this orange large jumper, heavy boots, and a white helmet. You are in a muddy, noisy terrain, surrounded by heavy machinery, but also by trees, clear water streams, and animals, a variety of animals. Now, we are going to visit a traditional community of the Brazilian Amazon that lives minutes away. You will see that they are rich of food and culture, but they are also very isolated. And because of this, they've been deprived of the basic health and social care services. This is where I worked. I used to work with the communities that lived near oil and gas operations. As you can imagine, oil and gas operations hugely impact the life of those who live nearby. But how to compensate for such impacts? Well, oil and gas companies often use social investment as a way of compensation. And my role was to implement social investment and I faced several dilemmas trying to do it. For example, I used to believe the company should provide communities with a basic health service. Why not? We had the means and the resources, right? Well, little did I know that when the operation ceased, so as social investment would, was it right to take away from the community the basic health service they needed? Dilemmas like that made me pursue a PhD in oil and gas social investment. I wanted to know whether other people that did the same job I did faced similar dilemmas. And I wanted to know how they solved those dilemmas. So, I interviewed 20 oil and gas experts from 11 countries. And they taught me that social investment may actually harm people if it raises communities' dependency upon the oil and gas resources. I have also learned that these experts are in a very complex position because they have to deal with different and often conflicting expectations of social investment from the community, the company, the government, and their own. And this can be a very tricky place to be in. Now, when I imagine myself going back to that muddy and noisy terrain, I know that social investment and impact compensation actions are different things, and they should be treated differently. I also know that social investment cannot be a substitute to the government. My PhD at the Otago University with Karen and Viv 
has given me an alternative lens to look at social investment. And I hope it does the same to others who want to understand or work with social investment in the oil and gas sector. Thank you. Thank you, Raffaella. You win the fan club prize so far. <laughs> and uh, again, it's very clear while you're, you're all here, you're very, all very uh, practiced and articulate, and that I want to take you on a journey is a good, good way to start. Um, I will leave my other judges to also give you praise. There's a lot to praise. Um, just in terms of, if you go through further, a little bit of voice practice to get that diction up and just the, 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 the strength of your voice might need a little bit of an improvement. Okay, thank you. You just delivered the perfect narrative. It had the beginning, the middle, and the end. It had the complication where it's supposed to have the complication. It had the re resolution and the discovery. So that was well handled. Thank you. It takes a lot of thought and planning to do that, and I'm very impressed. Thanks. Thank you. I really enjoyed the uh, opening story. It really transported us into that setting, and we learned about your motivation for the research. And like Craig has said, it really took us through the whole story to the end and the implications. So great job. Thank you. Thank you. That, that sloth country, Craig. Yeah. It's going to be good in you. It's awesome. Cool. Right. Next up, we have Andrew Mills. Andrew is doing his PhD in psychology. He is exploring capturing crimes on camera. Hmm, that's a little alarming. I might just move out of the camera. When you're absolutely ready, take it away, Andrew. Have you ever witnessed a crime? Maybe you've seen a handbag snatched in a crowd, or watched a fight turn nasty late on a Saturday night. If you see a crime occur, chances are you'll need to talk to the police about what happened. You might even be called up as a witness in court. If this happens, your ability to accurately remember the event becomes crucial. A couple of decades ago, the only tool to help you achieve that was your brain. But nowadays, witnesses to crimes are often armed with smartphones. They can instantly capture their surroundings in HD. I'm interested in how these wonders of modern technology might help or hinder criminal investigations. So could taking a photo help us to remember a crime? Maybe. Taking a photo focuses our attention, something we know builds stronger and better memories. But there's another possibility. Taking a photo could actually impair memory because we're outsourcing our memory, relying on the camera to remember for us. And that's exactly what recent research has suggested, that people on a museum tour were less likely to remember exhibits if they'd taken photos. Now, I began my PhD with lofty plans to study that particular effect further, to work out what made it tick, if you like. But no matter what I tried, I couldn't get the same effect. In science, we call this failure to replicate, although as a PhD student, I try not to focus too much on the failure part. Because after all, if you've taken a photo of a crime, then who cares what your memory is like? You've got a photo. What's actually more likely, though, is that people will have photos of the event where the crime took place, but not the crime itself. For example, a Castle Street local might have photos of a couch on fire, but none of the fire lighting culprit. So what I want to know is whether taking photos could affect other aspects of memory. One likely contender is confidence. To investigate this, I show people a movie of a flatwarming and have them take selected photos as they watch. Later on, I carefully interview these participants, asking about two crimes that occurred at the party. We hypothesize that by taking a photo, participants will become overconfident in their memory, even if their photos don't show anything useful. Now, most of the time, overconfidence isn't so bad. Annoying, but not harmful. But overconfidence in a witness is a big problem. Very confident witnesses tend to guess more when they're interviewed and they tend to be rated by judges and juries as more accurate. So that's where I'm up to now. My research could help inform investigators about the risks posed by confident witnesses. And for you, maybe my research will give you pause for thought the next time you reach for your camera. Thank you.
That's quite on the cutting edge of the world we live in. Um, look, it's left me with a lot to think about, actually. Just that three minutes alone has fired up a number of questions in my head I might want to ask you about one day. Yeah. So I think on that level, you've done your job. I felt that perhaps the subject of the talk meandered a little bit, um, but it's got me keen in wanting to hear more. So thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I really like your engaging body language and the rapport with the audience. I thought you absolutely nailed that. Fascinating topic. We've got to come back next year and tell us what the results are. <laughs> yeah, when I get them. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed this very much. Um, again, humour is good. So again, you got us, you got us engaged with, with a laugh a couple of times. And again, not all of these three-minute theses are at the end. So you, you made that clear of that's where I am up to now. That was a very good... Uh, marker that you haven't reached the point of being able to describe what the, the, the end results are. So that was good to mark that very clearly for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I guess we've all got a problem when we've outsourced our memory so much that we forget to take out our cameras. Um, right. Next up, we have Josie Cairns. Josie is doing a Master's in Geography. She is looking at investigations into soil moisture attenuation in a natural soil. When you are ready, Josie. You go home, you turn the tap on, water comes out. If you're in Dunedin, where does that water come from? It comes from places like this. This is my field site. It's called Glen Dew. It's just outside of Lawrence. Some of you maybe have been there. Soil moisture is about linking different processes of the hydrosphere. Hydrosphere, sorry. If you think about hydrology, usually we're thinking about rivers. We're thinking about the water that we can see. That water comes from somewhere. There's a process that goes from the rain coming down, it hits the ground, and something happens there. And that's soil moisture. So what I'm looking at is soil moisture attenuation. And that's talking about the changes and the distribution of soil moisture at depth. So we can see I've got from, made from Duplo on the left-hand side of my slide there, a soil profile. Now I've made it from Duplo because it's kind of hard to photograph. And we can look at the different levels there. As part of my masters at the field site, I have a set of six instruments at depth in the soil profile. So basically, at each of those titles that I've got, I've got an instrument that measures the percentage of volumetric water content. That says, how much water is here? Simultaneously, I measure the amount of precipitation that's coming through. So what I can see is the amount of water that's coming through and how fast it moves through that soil profile. Now, that's interesting to me, but why is that interesting to you? It's interesting because it connects an extra stage of the hydrosphere that we don't know a lot about. Before this study, the main uh, sites that we were using, the uh, background that I've been looking at, is based on a maximum of 12 weeks of data. Most of the studies that have been done in New Zealand have individual discrete events. So someone will go out and they will sample once or maybe twice, hopefully over a period of weeks. I have 11 months of continuous data at five minute intervals. So you compare what's already out there, 12 days, perhaps 12 weeks of data, to what I already have for a master's, which is 11 continuous months. What this does is it provides much greater understanding to be able to link these processes. In the future, we'll be able to put this sort of data into a model and build a conceptualization of where our water is coming from that will help to preserve these grasslands, which then will preserve the water that we need to drink. Now, many of you hopefully will remember a precipitation event that happened about three weeks ago. The river flooded, some people's houses flooded. At my field site, there was 150 millimetres of rain occurring over 30 hours. That's a lot for those of you that don't know. And for the soil moisture, at the top 10 centimetres, so that's at the humus layer, the soil moisture was increased for five days to 54%, as opposed to a usual average of 20% over the rest of the 11 months. Thank you.
Thanks, Josie. Of course I love the geography in there. Um, but great relevance to us and good setting the scene. Um, I felt you did glance a bit too much at the slide, could have kept our, um, you know, uh, contact with the audience more, but a good story, wanted to hear more about it, thanks. Yes, agree. Good engagement. Uh, again, it's a, it's a technical topic, but it's, again, you, you link more than once back to, back to what we have in our daily life and actually incorporating the recent event is very good. And I, you must know something about our MC, you know, whether, who, who is a Lego person. Now, whether you've done any harm or any good by using Duplo, I'm not sure. We'll have that <laughs> discussion later. That was really good. If I was doing it, I would start off with, we don't know where our water comes from. Because the second people grasp that, they understand the journey you're taking. It was in there, but just hit them in the face with it in the first sentence. But that was really interesting, and I'm looking forward to reading this when it's out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm for any kind of building blocks, actually. Yeah, so that's, that's all good. Thank you very much. Right. Next up, we have Nicola Beetson. Nicola is doing a PhD in accountancy and finance. Uh, her talk and thesis is on confidence matters. When you're ready, Nicola, please start. I started my literature review when I was four years old. I was given the book, The Little Engine That Could, and I was fascinated by the story. For those of you that don't know, it's about the smallest engine in the yard, given the job of taking the toys over the hill to the children waiting on the other side. As he goes up the hill, it gets harder and harder and harder, and he says to himself, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can, and of course, eventually, makes it to the children and delivers the toys. So how does this relate to my PhD? Well, it started a lifelong fascination with self-efficacy, or confidence. I've always been interested in this idea of self-belief and its power. So when I had to choose a PhD topic, I was teaching accounting at the time to first years. And I thought, I want to investigate the role of self-efficacy within accounting education. Now, I'm going to tell you something at this point that might shock you. Not all students want to learn accounting. In fact, accounting as a discipline is often seen as a little bit dull. Who knew? And yet, all students learning about business need to know at least a little bit of accounting before they graduate. Some students want to be there, they're excited, it's interesting. Other students, well, they see it as dull, boring, and hard. But they all have to be there, it's not optional. So what I've done is I've surveyed thousands of students across multiple semesters at two different universities, all enrolled in a first year accounting course. I've asked them about their level of self-efficacy with different aspects of the course, such as how confident are you with asking for help from your lecturers, from studying for the exam, organizing your notes. What about how confident are you to pass the exam? And what I've found is that their level of self-efficacy to do with the academic success is actually the most powerful predictor of whether they do succeed in the course, over and above all of the other variables that I gather data on, including whether they've done accounting at high school or not, meaning that self-efficacy is more powerful than prior learning in this context, which is really cool for me because it means I've taken this well-established theory brought it in and shown that it holds in an accounting education space. But excitingly, it also has a practical contribution for learning and teaching accounting. Because it doesn't matter if you think it is dull, boring, or hard. What really matters at the end of the day is whether you think you can. Or is it me first? Oh, what do I have to say? Lots and lots. I love the image. I, again, ambiguity is, I, is something I live by. Now, I'm just not sure whether your, your balance sheet is quite correct there, so you might just have to check the numbers. No, I think that was, that was wonderful. And um, I, was, I was making the comment, what can we do about it, when you're getting to the end, when you, when you answer the question that I started to form. So that was very good. Thank you. 
in terms of explaining what you've been studying, what you wanted to learn, what you've discovered, and why it's important. That was the entire package. Awesome. I thought it worked lovely. Um, thank you. Thank you. Great job, Nicola. Yet again, you managed to make accounting sound exciting, so <laughs> well done. It is. Like, it genuinely is. And I thought, I love the opening story too, one that most of us be familiar with, and I love the way you came back to that at the end. So it really was the whole package. Well done. Thank you. That woman is living a lie. <laughs> Oh yeah, we are all living a lie. Right, okie dokie. Next up we have Adil Akmal. Adil is doing a PhD in management and his thesis is on reducing unnecessary suffering through healthcare design and using lean thinking in your own time. Hi everyone, I'm here to talk about a service that we're all deeply connected with, the healthcare service. And the healthcare service has its fair share of dysfunctions to match its excellence, of course. And these dysfunctions play, are based around three factors, cost, quality, and capacity. And all in all, these dis dysfunctions bring a lot of unnecessary pain and suffering to the people and the patients, uh, and sometimes even uh, result in their deaths, which is really unfortunate. And if you think about that, these misfortunes, uh, these misfortune events like this, they don't happen because of bad medicine. We've got the, bad, the best medicine uh, our species ever got, and we're making it even better and better by putting the best minds onto it. These misfortune events happen because of the bad service design. And the reason behind it is very simple, because healthcare was designed with diseases at its center and not the people, uh, which is to say, of course, it was poorly designed. And nowhere are the effects of uh, bad design more heartbreaking and opportunities for good design more compelling than in healthcare. But it is not all bad news. There's still hope. A lot is going on in the healthcare sector in terms of uh, the redesign. And one of the basic principle uh, methodologies used to deliver that redesign is called lean thinking, which is a management philosophy uh, forged in the factories of Toyota. And it became the primary success uh, for Toyota's, uh, primary reason for Toyota's success. But the problem is that lean thinking is a very uh, foreign concept in, in healthcare. Its core idea is to link individual processes, human activities, and operations uh, of an organization to deliver more value to the customers while reducing the waste. And while in other industries, the definition of waste is always um, uh, related to monetary things, I believe, I personally believe in healthcare, the definition of waste should be related to this unnecessary pain and suffering that we have to go through. And this is where I come in. I'm looking into New Zealand DHBs implementing lean thinking uh, at micro details levels to see whether and how this foreign concept can actually help to create safer patient journeys and how the people inside the healthcare sector can actually uh, learn about this foreign concept, uh, understand it better, and adopt or adapt it to suit their needs to create a better uh, and safer healthcare system for all of us. Thank you very much. A deal, thank you, and I'll bet ODT wants to interview you this evening. Um, I actually didn't know what lean thinking was until I sat down and heard your talk, but the second you started explaining, I fully got it. Um, sound it looked like you were thinking a bit about what had to come next, what had to come next, what had to come next, just watching your eyes, and probably a few more repetitions and you'll be past that. Um, but that was informative, it made me want to learn more, and made me want to see you in the paper tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, Adele. Uh, great presentation. I, at first, I thought that slide was a bit busy. There was a lot on there, but actually, it was a really nice map of what you talked about, so Thank I you. did enjoy that um, visual. And obviously, great practical relevance, so thanks for that. Thank you. Yes, thanks, Adele. I also enjoyed the slide. Particularly, there's a little reference about another brick in the wall, and it brings me to some, <laughs> something that I had as a, as a musical interest in my earlier days. Um, but good, again, it, it, again, it has it, this um, topic, a question of what can you learn from making motor vehicles about making people better. So I wish you all the best for your research. Thank you very much.
hadn't heard of lean thinking either. I'm all for it as long as you keep it out of my dinner. Right. Next up, getting all mic'd up, is Deanna Beckett. Deanna is doing a Master's in Preventive and Social Medicine in the Health Sciences Division. And her thesis is on incorporating economic evaluation into oral health-related quality of life measure for children. Dental diseases are the most prevalent chronic diseases worldwide, with an estimated 2.4 billion people globally suffering from untreated dental decay alone. But what does that actually mean? Take a look at the image of this young woman. She has dental decay that is spread to the nerve and blood supply of her tooth. The tooth has died and become infected. The infection is spread through, drained out of the root of the tooth, and is pooling into the side of her mouth. That is why her face is swollen. At the top, you can see untreated dental decay. It doesn't look good, it doesn't smell good, and it's often painful. If your teeth or mouth look like this, it is not easy to eat, sleep, or concentrate. People make judgments, and this impacts on the way that you're treated. Now, in New Zealand, if you have a sore throat or the sniffles, you can go and see your GP, and your treatment is subsidised. But if you have teeth like this and you're over the age of 18, there is no government funding. And that means that unless you have the money to pay for private dental care, there is nothing you can do about it. And that is not okay. So how do governments decide how to split the health dollar? If you had to decide between treating one person with cancer or 20 people with tonsils, getting their tonsils out, what would you do? To make this process as fair and transparent as possible, many governments are relying on economic evaluation. One method is using a quality of life questionnaire with an algorithm that can calculate a quality adjusted life year, or quali. A quali is a unit of benefit measurement that considers not just the cost of treatment, but the length of your life and the quality of your life. It's what these guys need to help them make really big decisions. There are currently no oral health related quality of life questionnaires with the algorithm that can calculate a quality, and that puts us on the back foot when trying to make a case for funding. My research is looking at how we can get that quality. I conducted dental examinations for 87 people and gave each of them two quality of life questionnaires to complete. One was oral health specific and the other was generic. I wanted to know whether or not the general health measure with the algorithm was reading the same as the oral health measure and whether or not it was sensitive to actual oral health status. Because if so, we have something tangible that shows government oral health is important, people are suffering, they need and deserve treatment, and at the least it should be subsidised. Thank you. Thanks, Diana. I, I like the way you drew us into that in terms of giving us some facts about the prevalence of these problems. Uh, great images too, very powerful. Um, I want to find out more about it, which is obviously the point of these talks, so well done. Yes, thanks, Diana. Again, you used the, you used the full width of your stage and your gestures were good, uh, pointing us to the image while you were remaining engaged with us. Again, I liked it had um, some specifics. Again, you Often leading with numbers at the start of uh, however many million people is good, but you did a really good thing of then grounding of that and what does it actually mean. So a lot of very, very good uh, techniques there. Thank you very much. Yeah, I felt like you didn't need three minutes. You pretty much had that done in a minute and a half. We understood. We understood why it was important, and the rest was elaboration. And that means you've done a great job of encapsulating all your work and what it's about and why. So very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Look at what I have to go and work with five days a week to take so much Valium to go into that dental school. Right, 
Next up we have Ali May Jarvis. Ali May is doing a PhD in pathology and molecular medicine from Wellington. Uh, and her thesis topic is profiling, profiling innate like T cells in cancer. In your own time, Ellie May. Kia ora everyone. As you may know, those diagnosed with cancer in the later stages are more likely to die from their cancer. And this is because their diagnosis comes well after the cancer has spread throughout their body. And unfortunately, this means that our standard treatments are less effective. So we need to offer them something new. And that something is anti-cancer immunotherapies. So these are medicines that target the body's own immune system, and they specialize it into killing cancer. So to develop a good immunotherapy, we need to be able to drive a good T cell response. T cells are your bossy immune cells. They tell all the other immune cells what to do, how to kill the cancer, and they're also quite good at killing the cancer themselves. But not all T cells are created equally, and we're especially interested in the innate-like T cells. So these are your T cells. They do all the same things. They're just faster, they're generally better, and there's much more of them. So you get a much better anti-cancer immune response. However, there are many different ways to use innate-like T cells to treat cancer. For example, imagine it's your friend's birthday and you've been asked by them to make them something and their only specifications are to make it chocolatey. So there are a number of different things you could make. So let's, let's make a brownie. And there are a number of different recipes you could use, but this one will do. So you melt the butter, you add the sugar, you sift the flour, and then no eggs. This is kind of like how we make anti-cancer immunotherapies. We spend years developing something, we put it into people in a clinical trial and see if it works, but we don't stop to check what their existing immune response is like. It would be much smarter, like when cooking for our friend, if we actually checked to see what we had first, right? And that's what I'm doing in my PhD. I'm taking blood from people with advanced cancers and I'm looking to see whether these quick bossy T cells are still present whether they're actually still capable of killing cancer, and whether any of our current cancer treatments have an effect on their function. The aim of this is to inform the development of innate-like T-cell-based immunotherapies to treat these cancers. How do we do that? What treatments can we use them alongside? And overall, how do we spend all this, this money that we have in research to develop an effective treatment so that it's not too late in advanced cancer? Thank you. Thanks, Sally May. Uh, I like the way you um, took what is obviously very complicated research and made it understandable for the lay audience. So well done about that. I now know what a T cell is, a bossy immune cell. So thank you. Yes, I can relate to this as, as introduced. I, my research deals with things that are not, you can't hold in your hand and are not visible. So you did an excellent job in using the analogy, the recipe and the, and the imagine this um, to get that. And also, again, you led us through the story of what you're doing and what it may lead to, so thank you very much. Great graphics. Um, the metaphor of cooking makes sense. Um, I sort of feel sorry for you because you're dealing with something a lot more arcane than some other subjects, and that means your mountain is higher to climb to simplify and explain. Um, but I felt like I understood and I felt like I knew what the point was at the end of it and why we would all benefit if your work uh, continues. Um, and so I would consider that job done. Um, thank you very much. First thing, on Monday morning, I'm going to ask my boss to rename my job title as T-Cell. <laughs> right. Lucky last, and you must be kidding me with this title of this thesis, <laughs> gives me great pleasure to welcome Adam Denny, who's doing a PhD in physiology. He's uh, working on towards an understanding of FMD. <laughs> when you're ready, Adam. So, have you ever thought about how many times a day we smile? Whether that's smiling at someone in the street, smiling at a friend, or just smiling about the memory. Now think about if you couldn't smile every day and how that would make you feel. This is what people with fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy have to deal with. 
So fasciocapulohumeral muscular dystrophy, or FSHD, is an inherited skeletal muscle weakness and wasting disease, and it affects around one in 7,500 individuals worldwide. And around 20% of those affected will end up wheelchair bound. So this disease affects predominantly the facial, shoulder, and arm muscles, but it does progress onto other muscles within the body. And it's characterized by oxidative stress, inflammation, cell death, and a disorganization in the way our skeletal muscle forms. So whilst there is a lot of research going on into FSHD, it is in its infancy. And to date, there's no current treatment or cure for FSHD. The only treatments that we do have within the clinic are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or orthoses, which don't actually treat the pathological consequences of the disease. Therefore, it's imperative that we actually find some form of treatment which is effective and can improve quality of life for individuals with FSHD. So one thing we often do when we look for these treatments is we look for pharmacological fi fixes and we forget about the complexities of the whole disease. We often also forget about the complexities of the human body. And we look past this for these pharmacological drugs when the answer may actually lie within. So most of you will heard of, have heard about cholesterol and the fact we've got both good and bad cholesterol. And it's this good cholesterol which I'm investigating to see if we can use this as a treatment for FSHD. So good cholesterol, your high density lipoproteins, or HDLs, have been shown to um, alleviate oxidative stress, inflammation, and cell death. Three of the things which are the passive that characterize FSHD and are pathological within the disease. They've also been progressed onto clinical trials um, in humans for cardiovascular diseases, so we know they work. So to date, my research has shown that HDLs can significantly alleviate oxidative stress, cell death, and this disorganization in skeletal muscle, which we see within FSHD. And it's been so profound that it's brought it back to what we see in our healthy skeletal muscle, and we've now progressed this on to a preclinical model. Smiling is such a natural um, reaction that we often take these things for granted. This is what my research aims to give back. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Adam. Great image. And uh, again, connecting a complicated disorder to a simple thing such as a smile was a very, very nice instrument to use. Uh, again, nice full circle in that. Um, if I was going to be critical again, not critical of the, of the if the long word in the title, because you did a very good job yep. of getting to abbreviation, but you still had a bit of jargon there. You could have perhaps um, weeded out some, somehow. I promised my office I'd come home knowing how to say that word. <laughs> I, did, I didn't count on the accent, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was really interesting. And you had promising results. You know, you here's the problem. Uh, here's what's happening inside the body. Here's what we think. Here's what we're trying. Here's what we're learning. That was fantastic. Um, I'm excited to hear more about this. Um, I thought that was a good elevator pitch, literally. Um, if you got stuck in a box with somebody, you could bang that and they'd know exactly what you were all about. And that's the job, isn't it? So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, a, a very clever image there. I thought it was a great, quite clear explanation of the disease. And, and you took us through how you were researching it and what some of your results are. And it's clearly research that's making a difference. And I kind of like the way that you deliberately left your smile until the end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Adam. Um, I remain convinced that nobody can say that word. It's a little bit like physics. Right. <laughs> Yay. Okie dokie. Here's the finalists. We've heard from the finalists, and we've seen the finalists do their amazing, wonderful thing. Thank you very much for engaging, enjoyable, and illuminating performances. Now the pressure is on the judges. So... I'm going to ask the judges to retire, not just to deliberate, but just retire. <laughs> uh, go and make a decision, make it sound, follow the criteria, 
and you all can talk amongst yourselves. One more round of applause, though, for our wonderful finalists. <laughs> drum roll. <laughs> That's about as good as I can give for a drum roll. Oh, nice! Hooray! <laughs> I feel like a bossy T cell. Awesome. Right, I'm going to pass you to uh, our esteemed DVC, Richard. On behalf of the judges, I'd like to congratulate all of the finalists. That was outstanding. Uh, you all made our job very, very hard because there were no bad presentations. You have clearly uh, got a good grounding in your subject area. Your topics are all ones that you find engaging and interesting and compelling. You have all been coached well to be able to use those um, both visual and um, presentation techniques to draw us into the presentation. So we did um, find that they were all of a higher standard than I think I've been judging this for a number of years, a higher standard that I've seen overall. Um, however, in saying that, we had to come to some decisions. Actually, I should also say what you did is you made me feel inadequate. I did a three and a half year thesis and um, I certainly couldn't have hoped to have explained it um, in such a timely manner. Um, we did have to come to some decisions and we have done that and in the master's category uh, we have determined that the winner of the three minute thesis master's category award from the University of Otago for 2017 is Deanna Beckett. <laughs> And for the PhD category, um, we do want to, um, again, uh, acknowledge the excellent presentations from all of the candidates, but um, before I announce the winner, I would just like to give a um, special shout out to two highly commended ca candidates, Chidima Aham Chiaboto. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> And Rafaela Costa Camos Raballo, congratulations. Um, <laughs> you were both very, very close uh, contenders to our overall winner tonight, who is Nicola Beetson. <laughs> So um, to those winners, uh, go well, serve, uh, have fun when you are in Wellington or in Queensland and in particular we are confident that you will be uh, very uh, confident and excellent ambassadors for the University of Otago. Thank you very much. Well done, well done the winners, but I actually all think your winners to have come this far, it's just brilliant. It takes a lot to coordinate a 3MT, and there are a number of people to thank. Firstly, I would like to thank the teams in both marketing and communications and GRS for all their hard work in organising the heats. Particular thanks owed to Andrew Loney and to Kimberly Lamont. Thank you very much. Thank you, too, to the judges, uh, the judges and all the heats. There's a lot of people who went through those, uh, and to all those who participated in the heats as well. A big thank you is owed to our sponsor, David Smith, the director from Hello World Dunedin. <laughs> We've got to keep our sponsors happy. Um, I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for coming along and supporting your students, your friends, and your colleagues. And I'd like to thank the judges and finals for their insightful adjudication. 
Except for you, Richard. <laughs> no, I would like to thank them, and so should you. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank once more and congratulate the finalists. Getting to the final of the Otago 3MT is a huge achievement. You all did really, really well, and you should be proud of yourselves. I know that we are. So well done. You gave fantastic presentations, and I reckon you probably deserve a drink about now. One more time, congratulate them all. Fantastic. <laughs>